what was the design, I mean, roughly of the satellite? And we can hold off on the observational components, but what were the engineering feats and problems you had to overcome just with building this thing and getting it up there? Okay. Um, well, there are two versions, by the way, of the Kobe satellite. One was built to be launched by the space shuttle to go up from California. And then we had to redo it because after the Challenger blew up, yeah, we realized that was never going to happen. And maybe before we go on, though, I as I Challenger happened w- way before my well before my time, so I didn't really know anything about it. I look I looked it up as I was preparing for our interview. I watched the video, even knowing that it happened thirty something years ago. It, my heart was pumping watching this video. It was pretty terrifying. Why did this explosion of a space shuttle in Florida have an impact on your launching up a satellite on the other side of the country? Okay, well, number one, it demonstrated that we did not know how to launch the shuttle safely. Uh, Number two, we lost one. Um, And and actually, number three, never we didn't have a constituency of other people that wanted to be launching shuttles on the West Coast. So the combination of all of those three uh, said, well, we're just not doing that. So, uh, by the way, it's the, uh, the disaster. We've lost, we lost two space shuttles, one at launch and one in trying to land. Um, both of them are used in our annual NASA training about don't do that anymore. Um, understand risk, understand uh, things that are dangerous, and be alert to things that you should be alert to. I guess this is taking us sort of a bit far afield, but which is the one that we lost? The the name Columbia sounds right to me. The Challenger is the first one. Yeah. And that was launched, lost during launch. Yeah. Then this this Columbia was the second one that we lost, and it was lost when we tried to land because the wings had been damaged during the launch. Ah. Okay. So we had two major disasters, and both of them showed that we did not know how really to uh, have a properly reliable process for things that were really dangerous. Were there casualties with the Columbia? Because I saw that after the Challenger, oh, there were, okay, because I saw that they added ejectable seats and then pressurized suits, but I guess that didn't help in this instance. So um, the, uh, if your launch goes badly, then maybe you can inject before you're all the way into space. So that uh, protected indeed against further launch disasters, and we did not have any of those. Um, coming back on damaged wings, that wasn't going to help. Okay. I see. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for, for derailing your train of thought, but I had asked about the, the build of the satellite. You explained that the first version was changed after the Challenger. So then... We can talk about the second version and how things had to change. Yeah. So um, the main difference was um, the space shuttle had a completely different orbit that it could reach and and couldn't go as high. So that meant we had uh, 5,000 pounds of extra stuff for the space shuttle version that we didn't need anymore for the uh, Kobe that would go up on a reusable, sorry, an expendable Delta rocket. So we've shed 5,000 pounds, but we had to go to a different place and fit a different volume. So um, the big change was find a way to fit inside this much smaller rocket uh, and go where you wanted to go directly. So we were very lucky in that choice because um, the most difficult part of the instrumentation did not change at all. That was the part inside the helium cryostat. Uh, The instruments that were around the outside of the cryostat um, had to be made just a tiny bit smaller. And so they were lucky about that. Then what we call the spacecraft bus, all the mechanical structure and all the other parts, they had to be redone completely. But that's sort of normal engineering work, and we knew how to do that part. Hmm. I'm I'm talking to Alan Stern in a week or so, and he's leading another NASA mission. But one of the things that I find so cool about this conversation that we've been having is it's an opportunity to really talk about the engineering side of 
astrophysics, which I, I haven't had an opportunity to do before. So I hope you'll permit me some more detailed questions here about the satellite. And one, I saw that one of the major engineering problems or features that you had to work into the satellite was enabling it to move, orient itself in the emptiness of space. And I think I saw that there was a deployable mast, which is very Star Wars-y, if, if I'm correct about that. Well, we do have uh, two deployable things on that satellite. One is the little arm that holds the antenna, uh -huh. and it pushes down a little bit, and then there's actually a... a a vent for the helium gas is is there too to make sure that puts puts the uh, is unwanted thrust. We wanted to make sure the unwanted thrust goes in the right direction, hmm. and um, and the uh, solar panels had to unfold, and there was also an unfolding uh, conical shield that protects the instrument package from the sun and the earth. So all those were fairly ordinary but possible failure modes. Uh, so. A lot, of it, a lot of attention goes into making those things absolutely fail-proof. So it's the, the helium gas thruster that, or the gas thruster that is what enables it to move around and shift position. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, the helium gas comes from the helium cryostat. Oh, okay. Okay. Which is, a, that's what keeps the, two of the instruments cold. Uh, and the, we actually did not want the thrust that came from it to escape. Uh, so we had to make sure it did not try to turn the t observatory over. Okay. Make sure that the force points in the right direction. Then what was the apparatus that would allow it to move? Uh, I mean, beyond its natural Yeah, orbit. so we had to do something quite creative and unusual. It was one of the first big engineering problems that we had to solve. We needed to make sure that the observatory would always point away from the Earth as the observatory or orbited around the Earth. So the... And we had to make it spin around the symmetry axis. So it would not only look away from the Earth, but it would be spinning. So th I think we're the first people that ever had to do that. So how do you do that? Well, um, if your gigantic spacecraft is rotating, even fairly slowly, it's got a lot of angular momentum. And so it's a big top, a big gyro. You can't just turn it over. So what you have to do is have a competing gyro that spins exactly the same amount but pointing in the opposite direction. So the total angular momentum is exactly zero. And then this thing can point in any direction while it's spinning because something else is counter-rotating. So that was number one invention we had to have. And then we had to have uh, ways to control that rotation um, without th little thrusters. So... How do you do that? Well, we, the Earth's magnetic field is big enough at that altitude that you can have a magnet. Um, you have a, a, a big iron rod, wrap a, a coil around it, send current through it, and you've got a magnet that you can control. So we use that to control the spin of the rotation uh, of this remarkable thing. And then there's a whole lot of very complicated math behind it to know exactly how to do it. Yeah, I'm... I'm struck though, why is the spin so important? Because intuitively though, obviously you can adjust for spin after the data is collected. It sound it seems like this would give you a blurred image, like if you imagine trying to take a picture with a spinning camera. Yeah, but we did it on purpose for a very important reason. Mm. We needed to make maps of those spots on the sky, of the microwave spots. And those microwave spots are extremely, extremely faint, like a part in a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. of a very, very low temperature already. So we're looking for micro degrees Kelvin, changes right. of temperature. So how do you do that? Well, you can't do, a, do it. You have to actually have two antennas pointing in different directions, and then you compare them. So is that spot on the sky brighter than that spot on the sky over there? And you can try to com compute hundreds of millions of measurements, and then you stuff them into a, a computer program called the least squares fitting program, and it makes a map that fits all those hundreds of millions of measurements as well as possible. So, but that now means we have to spin the spacecraft to get all the combinations of two places on the sky 60 degrees apart. So that was that job. And that's why the whole observatory had to spin. Mm. I see. And we will, in a few minutes, when we talk about the results, hopefully get to 
uh, isotropy and an isotropy and why all of this is very important. I just still want to talk a bit about more about the engineering details, but you mentioned this shield to protect it from the sun and earth. And this I'm guessing is not to prevent damaging sort of radiation, but to prevent noise in the data. Is that? Yeah, it was two parts. So one is just sunshine is hot. So we okay. wanted the equipment to stay cool. Um, and one is the uh, sun and the earth are sources of microwave radiation that could interfere with the uh, measurements of the cosmic microwave radiation. So we need to block both of them. Hmm. And then two, two last things here. Uh, the, the first one that comes to mind is there is a lot of debris in space. I mean, I don't know if it's significantly more so now than then, but were there any ways of repairing Kobe if anything should happen to it, like a stray rock? No, uh, there were no way to, re to, to repair it. Um, and we did not need to repair it, um, as it turned out. Although we did have a failure right away after about three or four days, uh, one of the gyros failed. So we used gyros to tell how, how fast are we spinning. Uh, but we understood, even when they designed it, that they were not perfectly reliable and we better be ready. Mm -hmm. So the design accommodated a failure gy failed gyro. And so it was actually not a problem. It was just scary. Yeah, well, speaking of scary, after that movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock, where I think some stray space debris destroys some spacecraft that she's on, uh, at least in the zeitgeist, we have this idea that there are rocks all over the place zooming about in our orbit. Is that something that you would lose sleep over, or is it so low probability you just didn't expect that this would happen? No, actually, we knew there was a probability, but there wasn't anything you could do about it, and the probability is low. Mm -hmm. So um, we know that problem is getting worse, and people are working hard on trying to bring down the debris before it hurts anything. Mm -hmm. There are at least two uh, satellites where, where there were accidental collisions, and there were at least two satellites that were destroyed intentionally, producing a lot more debris. Mm. So we know there's a problem there, but anyway, so far, astronomy has mostly avoided it. Mm -hmm. The idea of these rocks, though, I mean, they're not moving at terrestrial speeds. They're going at hundreds or thousands of miles uh, an hour, maybe even a minute, and that's that's terrifying. Ten, tens of mi of miles per second. Yeah, <laughs> that's fast. That Very really scary. hurts if they hit you. Yeah, yeah. But exactly. There are also, by the way, natural rocks in space. And when I say a natural rock, I mean a grain of sand, uh, something that that you can barely feel because it's a thousandth of an inch in diameter, is common in interstellar space, and the, and they're always falling on the Earth. And if they hit you, you would feel it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it'd go right through you, maybe. No, it wouldn't, but it would definitely hurt. Okay. It could go through your spacesuit hole and make a hole. Mm. That's not good. <laughs> not, but, no. Uh, so there are, I, I briefly mentioned this a little, a, f a few minutes ago, but there are, there are plenty of very successful ground-based telescopes. Why was COBE essentially the, a space-borne telescope? Because there are microwave detectors on Earth, too. Yeah. The, there were two reasons. One is that uh, you basically couldn't possibly make the measurements from the ground at all um, because of the interference of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and we'd already gotten about as far as we could with measurements on the ground. So we knew you couldn't do it from the ground. And then we knew it would be much better if you could get a complete map of the entire sky as compared just to a little piece. So for both of those, you need a space mission. And okay, now to talk about the observational components, you mentioned some of the ones that were on the on its predecessor that came, I think, with or after your postdoc. But there are three. I'll read them out loud because I I definitely couldn't have remembered them. There were the the far infrared absolute spectrophotometer, the a word I've never said out loud before, the differential microwave radiometer, and the diffuse infrared background experiment. So what did these three things account for in the, the COBE? Yeah, so the first one, 
was to measure the spectrum of the cosmic microwave radiation. And that was the one that was a direct outgrowth of my thesis project. So um, it uh, operated by sensing the radiation with a tiny thermometer. Uh, and before the radiation got to the thermometer, we sent it through a thing called an interferometer. So we changed the amount uh, of, of heat arriving at the thermometer in a known way so we could tell what was the wavelength of the light that was coming in. So that was, a, it's called a Michelson interferometer. So that was this a secret optical thing that had been developed by people in Britain. And then we uh, used a version of it for my thesis project. Then we said, well, we'll, new, we'll just improve it for the satellite. Uh, its special addition was something you could never have done on the ground or even on a balloon, which was to have a thing we call a black body, a big chunk of plastic that would emit radiation exactly the way we say the Big Bang radiation should be. So um, when you put this piece of plastic in the antenna and you get the same answer that you had when you were looking at the sky, you immediately know you've proven that the, the uh, prediction is, is, is right. So it only took a few weeks before we were able to make that announcement. So, so that's how that one works. Uh, the second one was to, it's called the differential microwave radiometer. And that's the one with the two, with the pairs of antennas that point in different directions, 60 degrees apart, and you collect all the combinations and then you make a map. So it's differential because it's comparing two antennas and, uh, and it operated at three different frequencies, uh, 31, 53, and 90 gigahertz about. And uh, that's where the uh, equipment worked well enough and the cosmic background is bright enough so we could make a map. And the third one was to look for the light of the first galaxies. Uh, and it had a t small telescope of about eight inch diameter um, and it uh, very coarse resolution in, but because we were just trying to collect the total brightness of the sky. Um, but then we had to study the, the, the radiation of everything. Everything radiates at infrared wavelengths. <coughs> There's stars that radiate, and you know where they are. There's interplanetary dust, which we call the zodiacal light, and it's pretty bright. And then there's that inter, inter, interstellar light uh, coming from interstellar dust, and then uh, a whole lot of messy stuff. But the am ambition was, after you take account of all of those things that are nearby, is there anything left that could come from the most distant galaxies? And the answer was, yes, there is. The universe is about twice as bright as people thought it would be. And we still don't really know why. Hmm. Well, the last component of the COBE that I wanted to ask about, and it's already come up when we were talking about this unwanted helium thrust, is the helium cryostat. And I have the sense that this was quite innovative and something that was prototyped. I, maybe you mentioned this or developed for an earlier project of yours. So what was this piece of equipment and why was it so vital for the instruments that, that we just discussed? Okay. Well, it's called a cryostat. Cryo means cold in Greek. So we want to keep something very cold. In this case, we need to have it at about 1.4 degrees Kelvin very close to absolute zero. And the way we do it is we have liquid helium in a big tank. Now, liquid helium evaporates, uh, boils away, basically, and uh, carries away the heat that's getting in uh, as, as a cold vapor. So uh, the technology behind it is uh, a big metal reservoir of helium, um, and that's protected by many, many, many layers of what we call super insulation. When you buy a space blanket down at the museum, as you get this, uh, layers of thin metalized plastic, we have a, a lot of those in between the uh, tank of helium and the outer shell. And so that's a helium cryostat to keep something very cold in space. And there's a, a totally astonishing phenomenon that we use to keep the helium in and let it out gradually because uh, at the temperature we're interested in, helium is a thing called a superfluid which means it's a quantum mechanical liquid and um, it has zero viscosity. It will flow through little tiny holes. And uh, so how are you going to keep it in? So somebody at Stanford University in the 60s invented a porous plug 
So it's like an osmosis thing where you remember when in high school you might have tried sugar water in a carrot? No, yeah, I never and, did that. And you didn't try that. Anyway, uh, you can pump this liquid helium by temperature differences. So you can keep the helium in the tank if it's warmer in the tank than on the outside. So that's the method of the helium porous plug. And so it was invented before us. It was perfected for the infrared astronomical satellite, the IRAS, that was built a few years before us. And you know, built, by the way, at Ball Aerospace Corporation in Boulder, Colorado. So a, a, a major, major technology development. Though we wouldn't have the astronomy program of today without that. Do you think there's anything about Kobe, the satellite, that's really important that we haven't discussed yet? I know that there were many challenges that it faced, the Challenger being one of them, but I wanted to make sure that we covered all of the the notable engineering aspects. So I'm sure that... Uh, yeah, well, there's one one important thing to mention, which is everything's different when people's things are cold. Metal isn't even the same. Mm -hmm. Some kinds of metal just disintegrate because they change their crystal structure when they get cold. And plastics become brittle. Now, lubricants don't lubricate. Oil becomes solid. So um, engineering something to run at a low temperature like that is a big pain in the neck the first time. Um, and then to actually succeed, you have to test everything more than once. So it's turned out to be immensely difficult to do. On the other hand, we learned how to do it. And when we had done it, we said, now we're very much more brave. And a few years later, we got a chance to build the web telescope. And we needed all of that expertise that we now had because we had just solved some terribly difficult problems. So it's no longer the first time when somebody says we need a cold telescope. Yeah, this notion that things are very different when they're cold is very important. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was the root of the problem with the Challenger was that these little devices called O-rings became rigid when they shouldn't have been because of the temperature that morning. And this is what resulted in uh, a leak and the subsequent explosion. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there was That was the engineering design. And then there was the human design, which said, we're going to forget that. We're not going to believe the engineers. We're going to launch anyway. <laughs> 